Today is August the 9th, 2017, and we're in Bowling Green, Kentucky. My name is Earl Willis, and I work for the Warren County Public Library. Today we're talking to Diane Butts. Uh, Miss Butts, where and when were you born? I was born in Warren County, Kentucky, Bowling Green, Warren County, uh, on the 23rd of December, 1957. Okay, so you was born a little before Christmas, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, did you have any uh, parents and siblings, uncles, aunts that were in the military? Yes, my father went into the military. Okay. Ernest Butts Jr. Okay. And he's a native of Bowling Green as well. Okay. Uh, when, when did he serve in the military? Oh no, <laughs> six sixty. Uh, uh, I think in the sixties. He's okay. he's buried. He's deceased now. Okay. Uh, but he was a private that went into the Air Force. Okay. And uh, part of the Korean conflict. Okay. I, I figured he might be in the Korea era. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have any other like uncles or cousins or? Yes. You? Barry Mills, um, originally of Bowling Green. Uh, he worked for UPS and retired from there, big executive. But he was in the Army, um, my uncle. And uh, then my brother-in-law, was in the Army, I lives in Glasgow, Kentucky. Okay. Uh, Doc Glover, William Glover. Okay. Uh, did you did you think that made any impression on you when you were a, a small child or growing up? Did you, did you think about the military? Did you talk about the military? Or I had no inkling that I would go into the military as a child. I uh, my my ambition was to be an accountant and go to school. And uh, they recruited me pretty hard out at Bowling Green High School okay. and uh, offered me an opportunity to go to West Point to be an officer. I said, no, no, I'm going to Western yeah. to be an accountant. Okay. So uh, after that recruitment, and Sergeant Lambert still is here today. Okay. Uh, he recruited me and uh, joined the 21st, 23rd Transportation Company as a PFC on the delayed entry program. Okay. Uh, so what did... Were you, so you you uh, you enlisted, correct? Right. Okay. So what were you doing before you went in the military? Did you just graduated high school. I graduated from high school, uh, and it was a high school when when they started recruiting me. And I graduated when I was seventeen, and uh, then I joined the National Guard. Okay. Uh, but before then, I was at school, and then I went to school for a year at Western before I actually did my basic training. Okay. Now, what year is this when you enlisted? Nineteen seventy-five. Nineteen seventy-five. Two, exactly two months before the end of the Vietnam era. Yeah. yeah. I was, July 7th. I was born the day that uh, Saigon fell, April 29th, 1975. Mm. Uh, so, did your, what did your, uh, your, what did your mother and father think about you going into the military? They were both very, very proud, but, but dad was more specifically when I got my commission. You were commission officer. Uh-huh, in uh, 1980, and he came to the rotunda at uh, Frankfort, Kentucky. Okay. And uh, he was there and and took a picture with him and my attack officer. Okay. And just very happy and proud man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so where do you remember being sworn in? Where were you sworn in at? At Frankfort. In Frankfort? Okay. Did you... Did you fly or did you ride a bus to your uh, basic training? Oh, you mean when I was first sworn in as a uh, private? Yes. Private first class. That was uh, here in Bowling Green, and it uh, happened at the Armory. Uh, and that was before I went to, I uh, flew to Port Jackson. Okay. South Carolina. Well, that's, a, that's probably the first time you ever flew an airplane, right? It was. Okay. Yeah. So what, what, what were you thinking when you were flying on the airplane? Were you nervous, excited, uh, apprehensive, a little everything? A little everything. Uh, nervous, and, and what I did on that plane is I always said the Lord's Prayer. Yeah. And thank you, Jesus. Yeah. You know? uh, so I've made it all these years. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it would be, did, you, did your father kind of, did, did you talk to him about maybe what to expect? I don't recall that at all. Okay. He was running a business, and of course, you know, mom was caring for the kids and, and Brownings and Girl Scouts and all that yeah. kind of stuff. So 
And I guess it had been so long for him as to what to anticipate. Of course, yeah. he told me some war stories over the yeah. years. But uh, as far as training, what I was expecting to do there. Uh, but I think I had a good, a good, uh, uh, a good definition of what I might happen. I was in um, the, in the band in high school. Okay. So we marched. Marched. And 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 our uh, band director always taught us, you know, to march. And he was military. He did things pretty militarily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, where did you, is that is that a picture of you when you when you when you, when you were, uh, graduated basic training? Exactly. Okay. It is. Yes. Okay. Yeah, because that was kind of like a picture that you would give like your mom or your dad or your family when you when you graduate boot camp. Yeah. Uh, where did you go to your basic training at? At Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Okay, okay. Do you, what time of year was it? Uh, it was in January. January, okay. So it, it was some cold there. So it was probably better than that than being like July or August where it was really hot and humid and everything. Or was it? I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. I that you have uh, challenges either way. Either way, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you a funny story. Okay. After basic training was over with, they told us they were taking us to the airport in these cattle trucks. Okay. You know, where they put cattle in, yeah. basically. And uh, we kept riding and riding and riding. And I said, man, what's going on here? Next thing I know, we woke up. And we were in uh, Fort Benjamin Harrison, Indiana, snow on the ground. So we weren't going. <laughs> <laughs> to the airport. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I just told you what you needed to know. Yeah. To, to hush you up. Yeah. You know. uh -huh. Did you uh, do you remember what you when you when you first got to the, to uh, your basic training? Did you have uh, sergeants there meeting you or? Yes, and they were hard. Okay. They were talking up in your ear and you. You racking in, trying to be. <laughs> okay. Even uh, now, I've talked to a lot of guys that when they went to boot camp. Uh, now, how how is was it female instructors? Uh, they were both male and female instructors. And they they still were in your in your real close up and and putting you in your place still. Putting you in your face, putting yeah. themselves in the face. You yeah. know, asking you two people asking you questions. You know. Yeah. Um, and it was it was cold, and we were responsible for the other uh, comrades, you know, at the time, uh, for what they did. And I had to run after somebody one time because he was acting real crazy, and they called me a football player. Okay. <laughs> I tackled her down. Yeah, because yeah. you had to be punished for something that she did, right? Mm -hmm. uh, was there any like instructors that that stood out in your mind or helped you out or talked to you extra or? Drill Sergeant Leonard. And uh, Sergeant Grimble, she was uh, a real starched uh, marcher. You know, you're left, right, left, right, left, right, left, and I always remember that. And um, actually, I was selected to uh, to be like the soldier of the quarter, or whatever they called it, an okay. honorary. Uh, so I was recommended for that. But when I got there. I froze. Couldn't remember nothing. Yeah. So. Well, I guess that's pretty common because stuff like that's stressful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, so was it, did, what was your, did you do a lot of PT, a lot of physical training? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But at that time, you only had to do, women had to do modified push-ups. Okay. You don't have to, yeah. And it was a five uh, event PT test and you only had to do a half mile. Did you, were you in pretty good shape when you were younger? Athlete? Oh yeah, you know, I was in band and athlete. I, uh, I didn't play basketball then, but I played racquetball okay. and, and uh, or I ran and took some karate classes. Okay, so you, you were pretty in shape and you didn't have any problems with that. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember, did you adjust to the uh, Military life, or did you take your while to get used to getting up early? And oh no, we met and we were just kosher. <laughs> Me and the military, I enjoyed okay. it. You enjoyed I it. Acclimated very well to it. And okay. Do you remember uh, riding back and forth to your parents? Did you? I mean, you first get there, you make a phone call, like for like thirty seconds or a minute, and 
you say you were there, right? Kind of, or? I don't remember that, but I know I, I, I kept in touch with my parents and friends. I wrote letters because I like it letters. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Did you, was it, what, was this, what was your favorite part of your basic training? Was it graduating or was it anything you liked doing? I liked the girls that I met. I, I, and I'm just now recalling Bobby Slavin was my roommate, but we had to go up three flights of steps, okay. you know, so you, you picked your room when you got up there and I had all my gear on. Yeah. I didn't like that, but you know. So the camaraderie that was created during the, uh, during the training was. Do you, did you, uh, you get to fire weapons? Oh yeah, we had to go to weapons training. Okay, so you, had, you, you, you used the M16, was the M16? The M16 and then when I got commissioned, I, uh, 45. Okay, the 1911. Pardon me? The 1911 pistol, the 45 1911 pistol. I don't remember. Yeah. Okay, the 45. Yeah, yeah, yeah. shot the 45 round. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, So, uh, we, was that the first time you fired a weapon? Yes. Um, I was exposed to, to weaponry with my, my dad. He, okay. uh, he was an avid hunter. Okay. You know, uh, he had a 9 millimeter. Okay. And I shot that after I, I joined the military. Okay. So, uh, so how long was, was uh, boot camp or your basic training? Uh, two months. Two months? About two okay. months. Okay. And so after your, uh, your two months, uh, where did you go from there? What was your, what was your, uh, your uh, MOS? Your I was what they call a 71 leader, administrative and uh, supply clerk. I okay. ended up doing that at the transportation company that I came back to. Okay. Did you, uh, once, you, once you left your basic training, where did you go from there? Uh, to AIT, uh, okay. Advanced Individual Training at Fort Benjamin Harrison. Okay. Can you, can you tell us some about what you did there? Well, it was, uh, we had the World War II barracks, uh, which was different from uh, Fort Jackson. They had the, the buildings, the brick buildings. Okay. And uh, there we had the World War II barracks. And... Uh, it was all along the side, and then we had a brick building that we went into for our training. So okay. we had to um, do PT and busy all day, you know, in school. Okay. So. Uh, were you, now what was your rank then? Were you a private first class? Private first class. Okay. I came on the delayed entry program, okay. so I was never really a private, but private. Okay. I was a PSC. Okay, yeah, because you just kind of skipped one, then you went to the first, private first class. Right. Yeah, okay. uh -huh. so I had a year, year of college under my belt. Because that kind of, when you have a year of college that you don't have to be there, like the rank private, you, you get to go to the private first class? Or well, it, it really depends upon the programs that the Army or uh, the military has at the time. Okay. So, you know, you, you've had direct commissions in the past. Okay. Uh, but it was a big, uh, big appeal for women to come in. They were okay. really trying to get women to come in. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when you, uh, so how long did you stay? It was at Fort Bennett? Fort in Benjamin? Fort Benjamin Harris. Okay, how long what, did you stay there? Two months. Two months? Okay. And uh, where did you where did you move on from there? Did you? I went back to my unit at uh, 21st, 23rd Transportation Company back here in Bowling Green. Okay. And I stayed as a, a National Guard's woman. Okay. Uh, until I went to the uh, OCS program, uh, the Officers Candidate School, sponsored by the uh, National Guard. Okay. And, uh, we, we uh, trained out of Fort Knox and graduated at uh, Frankfort, Kentucky. Can you tell us some about your, your that, that kind of training, your, your officer training school? Yes, uh, that was uh, a little more intense than basic training. Uh, here you had what they call TAC officers, training uh, officers. Um, and they would, we would go to class and we would uh, run. And of course the, the requirements were greater at that time. And that was in 19, it went from 1979 to 1980. Okay. And uh, we would have square meals at the barracks okay. and we had to run right after we got done there. And we would have what they called um, bat drills. So in the middle of the night we had to get up. Okay take all the barrack stuff outside, set up, go to sleep, then wake back up and go back in. Okay. So uh, that was, that was,
getting you to ready to be a leader, right? Because you were going off to training school. Yes. Okay. Uh, what, when you graduated off to training school, what was your rank? Then? Second lieutenant. Second lieutenant, okay. Uh, so I know sometimes when you when you graduate ROTC, you're uh, usually like a first lieutenant maybe. When you, like the guys that go to Western, they graduate ROTC, I think they commission like a first lieutenant and a second. Second lieutenant. Second lieutenant, okay. Second lieutenant. So you're you are officer now. You're a commissioned officer now. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that you told me that you're, uh, your father's pretty proud of that, you being an officer, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so what, what, do you remember how you felt when you were commissioned as an officer? I was elated. Yeah. I was like, wow. And, you know, I used to work with the Kentucky Military Academy okay. as, as an enlisted person. And um, I would see them train you know, march and run and do all these obstacles and so forth. And I said, I think I can do that. I think I can do that. So I signed up the next. Yeah. Uh, soon thereafter. A lot of it's in your mind. Mm. A lot of times you, everybody's physical, it seems like everybody's physical uh, abilities, sometimes they're even, but the one that, the thing that makes you go above is your, your uh, the power you have in your mind that you can do things and not give up. Uh, so, uh, so you, we were a second lieutenant. Where did you, where did you, uh, when you were a second lieutenant, where did you go from, like your uh, uh, duty assignment duty after uh, after I was commissioned? Uh, I went back. I came back here, and I was with the 103rd Brigade, and I was working as a uh, EEOC officer. Okay. And uh, I stayed there. For maybe a year or less and then I got a letter from my because I was commissioned as a logistics officer and I got a letter you know from um, the military academy and they said well you need to get your commission you need to you know get your advanced training okay. or you're going to lose your commission okay. so I went back to Fort Harrison and instead of getting it in logistics I got it in uh, as a, a uh, administrative officer called the Adjutant General Corps Okay, okay. Because a lot of times, like, you, if you when you have a job, you have to get your your still have to get your training up, so you won't learn. You lose your like, certification, kind of like in the civilian world. So that was kind of what you were exactly some, somewhat doing something like that. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. and so uh, how did you have any like friends that you hung out with, or did you keep to yourself, or your, as far as in your free time, what did you do? With, while I was in training? Well, actually, no, act not when you're on training, like in your military life. No. I'm sorry. I after? Guess, oh, I mean, actually, when you were second lieutenant, what did you do in your free time? Uh, before I went to training? Yes. I was in college. Okay. So I was very, very busy. Okay, so you didn't have any free time? No, really, I was I was in everything. Okay. I was in the accounting club, I was marching in band, I was working as a student. Okay. Higher and uh, studying, and then okay. I was in ROTC for a little bit okay. before. Did you have any friends when you were? Uh, I guess what I'm saying is when you were in the, in the military, like when you were a second lieutenant. Was there any friends that you hung out with more in the military than others? Did you have like people that you considered your friend and hung out with them and went and went and did things with them? And well, there's a difference between active duty and reserve and national guard. Okay, so. The friends that I made in, in, in the guard doing um, training, uh, they lived in other places. Okay. So, you know, you went back to your respective reserve or guard unit. Okay. So, um, what really made a big difference was when I went on active duty. Okay. So, right out of the advanced training, instead of coming back to school to finish my two classes in accounting, I went on to active duty and I stayed on for about 13 years after that. Okay. What was your first uh, active duty station? At Camp Zama, Japan. Okay, so you went to Japan. Mm -hmm. So that so that was definitely the first time you left the United States, right? Exactly. Okay. Do you remember how you felt knowing that you were going to Japan? I was nervous. Nervous. Uh, scared. And uh, when I got to Seattle, Washington, my bags were tagged for Osan. Japan, okay. but I was going to be stationed at Camp Zama, Japan, okay. and they were 
pretty pretty many miles apart pretty from much. one another. Okay. So when I found that out, one of the um, transportation guys kind of helped me get that straight and rerouted my bags so that was scary and then going to a new country yeah yeah uh, eating different food different language and different oh, culture yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, how did you adjust to the culture well uh, they have what they call um, oh, if I can remember um, a sponsor Okay, so yeah. So that was part of part of the military regiment is to have a sponsor to help you get acclimated to the area, get your place to live, and okay. and all of that. So, but I love Japan. Okay. We became cohorts. Okay, so that was kind of was that surprising that you that you uh, liked Japan as much as you did? Well, I think I think uh, I had an ambition to go overseas. I had studied some of that before. Okay. So, but I just jived with the, with the economy and, and, and the people there. Great duty, great duty there. Okay. Did you eat uh, Japanese food mo mostly, or did you eat like American food on, on, the, on the base? Well, we had a mess hall, and I became the executive officer for and the mess officer. So we, we had great meals there. You know, we had uh, shrimp. Okay. <laughs> uh, each day of the week was a special, you know, cultural eating. But on the outside, I loved the food. As a matter of fact. Uh, since I've been home here in Kentucky, in Bowling Green, I found a Japanese restaurant right next okay. door. Is it, is it pretty close to the, the, the food you had in Japan? That is authentic. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so, did you, did you learn Japanese language, any words, or? Well, I speak a little Japanese. Okay. And um, they just love me over there. Okay. <laughs> uh, I learned some Japanese. I took a class, but didn't learn much there. It's when I got on the economy and started riding the bullet train and the regular train. That's where I really got to uh, speak the language, and they say my dialect is good. Okay. Uh, what was your What was your typical day when you were in Japan? What, when you were stationed in Japan? What was like? What was your typical day in the army? Well, I had two jobs over there in mainland Japan, and I worked under uh, the first four-star black general, General Roscoe Robinson Jr. Okay. And uh, I stayed there for about three months, working in the G1, which is kind of administrative personnel section. You know, you have G1 through G6 now. I actually got G7. Um, so I did that for a little bit, did what they call plans. And then I uh, got assigned as the, uh, as a second lieutenant, as the executive officer for the uh, headquarters company. Okay. And what I really liked about that was I would sign all the senior officers' <laughs> papers when they went on leave. But okay. uh, yeah. So, uh, did you have any free? Did you have more free time when you're in Japan than you were in the states? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so, so it was generally yeah. so get up in the morning, do PT. Okay. Go eat breakfast, do your job, get off around five or six. It depends on what was going on. Okay. What other time? What kind of free things did you do as your free time in Japan? Was it any certain thing like sightseeing or? Well, I, I did that um, when I got uh, comfortable with riding the train. They had a, a cultural class, you know, and uh, I would go out there all the time um, on weekends and go to Tokyo and uh, go to the club and sing. And okay. And what, now, what year is this? Uh, I went over to Japan in 1981. Okay. okay. Uh, yes. Did you did you uh, like, was, did you mingle with other people? I know there's a lot of uh, Marines in Japan also, right? Yes. Did you mingle with other the different branches, or just maybe mostly just the army? No, and the army was probably the smallest element over there at that time. Okay. Uh, there was a uh, a Sugi Air Force Base, which was commanded by uh, a Navy captain. And we'd go over there, and we'd have, you know, coordinated activities. Um, we would also have the, and there used to be a separation of the enlisted club and the uh, officer club, but over there, because it was so small, it was a consolidated club. Yeah, I know in the States there's like enlisted clubs and officer clubs mm -hmm. and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, how long did you spend in Japan? Three and a half years. Three and a half years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you, what was your... Okay, what was your next duty station? I I stayed in mainland Japan uh, for about 
18 months. Okay. And then I went down to um, this U.S. Army Garrison Honshu, and then I went to U.S. Army Garrison Okinawa. So I went to the island down there, and there's where the Marines yeah, were yeah, Okinawa, plentiful. Yeah, that's the World War II battle, Okinawa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, did you did you did you uh, how long did you stay in Japan? You said three years. Three and a half years. Okay. Where was your next duty station? Did you I went back to Fort Harrison, Indiana. No, so you went, so you, went from, you go from Indiana from Japan to Indiana, so you had to kind of get rid, used to the uh, North American. Uh, kind of lifestyle and I guess culture. Or there, there was not that much different because I was still, you know, working in military, wearing you know okay. uniform and, and doing all the military type duties there. Okay. Uh, so, but I came back. Uh, it was not. Uh, it was not a big transition. Okay. So, but I'm back in training. Okay. And uh, uh, that was six months. Okay, six months. Uh -huh. so were you still a second? You still a second lieutenant then, also? No, I. By the time I came back, I was a captain. Okay, you were a captain. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so, uh, what did your father think about you? How you was working your way up from, like, uh, a private, and you were a second lieutenant, or private first class, second lieutenant, and then you are your captain. Pretty proud of that. Oh yeah, man. Yeah. My family, you know, yeah. friends that I stayed in touch with. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, ultimately, do you remember when you? Okay, I think we've talked before. You were uh, lieutenant colonel when you retired. Yes. Okay. Uh, can you you want to tell us about maybe how you made lieutenant colonel? Well. Uh, without without skipping too much, just I mean. Well, see, my, my, my first stateside du active duty assignment was in, um, at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Okay. And I worked with what they uh, called the Command and General Staff College. And uh, that is where the Buffalo Soldier is now erected by uh, General Colin Powell. Okay. He, but I didn't go back for that, but I was there for four years. So there was a uh, captain's course that, that uh, all the captains went to, you know, and you had to complete that. And then there was the, the course to make major, you had to complete that course. Okay. So uh, I was there at the school, what combines arms uh, services staff school, which has changed to what they call ILE. And, uh, Individual leadership. I don't know what the E stands for. I, forget. I didn't go. Okay. Uh, that that happened later on. Um, so after I left there, uh, I completed the, the the course and I made major. Uh, not too soon after that, uh, and, and what was my next duty station? Korea. Oh, Korea. Okay. Of course, of course, it was the South part of Korea. Yes, was, yeah, yes, it was, yes. No, yeah. Uh, did you did you ever? I talked to some people, uh, uh, people in the military that I've interviewed. Did you ever visit the the uh, the demilitarized zone? DMZ, I did. Okay, that was scary. Yeah, I've heard people say that it's, it's very eye opening, mm -hmm. especially if you just live in Bowling Green and never seen anything, you know, anybody hostile. But you've got people there that just hate, that think very ill of you. Yeah, and what you know, I, I had already been overseas. To, you know, even went to the Philippines, but that was on a vacation. Um, but the difference was, it was the enemy right there. You saw, yeah. And you over here, so you know, you go over there and you're like tippy toe over there, like, okay, this is enough. Let me go back, because you felt like it was. It's almost like going into a prison, in a sense, and you can't wait to get out. Yeah. <laughs> So it was, it was, I guess it was all like you see in movies, the big barbed bar wire fences and the guards and the military presence and very military, military, yeah. Well, did you ever talk to any North Korean soldiers, or officers, or? I don't recall. Now, uh, we had what we call, uh, in Japan, the ground self-defense force. So I did a lot of um, uh, collaboration with them. Because you know, as part of the mission in in Japan, um, 
And then Korea, I, I had uh, some collaboration with the Korean officers there, but the South Korea. South Korea. Not, not Korea. Korea. I, don't, I don't think I ever talked to them. Okay. I don't, I, don't know, I don't know if they have they uh, interacted with Americans or... Like I said, oh, it was a scary thing, and I'm just feeling the fear right now. Yeah, yeah. I, I've talked to other people. It was, I think there was uh, maybe, I've talked to a couple guys, that I think there was maybe in the early 80s, there was an incident where uh, maybe an officer, American officer, he got murdered on the demilitarized zone. It was it was something pretty, pretty uh, hostile. Mm -hmm. But you know, um, throughout the years uh, of the military, we've had friendly and hostile fire. Yeah. So and uh, so we've had like in Japan, we we had some Marines that did some very you know horrific things to to the elderly over there, and you know of course there's infighting. Uh, but you know overall, we we tend to. Make it through and do what we got to do. One facing. Yeah. Uh, do you do you remember what year you made lieutenant colonel? Uh, let's see. Hey. I really don't. Uh, but it. Uh, let's see. It seemed like it was ninety. Something. I remember. I'd have to look at my papers. It has it on. Okay. But it's been it, it, it's been at least 15, 20 years, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. Was there a special ceremony for you making lieutenant colonel? Yes. Uh, at that time, I had already so I went to Korea, came back to the states, and uh, I got off of active duty, and I went into a reserve unit in Virginia. Okay. And I was stationed with the Special Operations Support Command, which changed to the Joint Forces Command, uh, where there were basically Navy, and we had some Army there, uh, but it was SF. It was unusual. People would ask me, how did you get an uh, assignment with SF, you know, Special Forces? I said, I don't know. It just happened. And I was assigned not to an infantry position, but, you know, to an administrative position, J-1. And um, I had a ceremony there, and I remember it very well. Was your, was your, your father still up? Uh, no, he, he passed was away. He, he passed away before he got to see you. Right. Was your your mother was she was, was she able to? Uh, did she? she no, she her? didn't travel. Okay. Um, uh, I had some very um, that I'm still good friends with. Some I had I finally had a baby. I got. Pregnant in Korea. Okay. And um, of course, she came back with me. And um, well, she was with me. I was I was on the plane. Okay. <laughs> I was still pregnant at eight months. So I went. I got a choice to do. So I wanted to go to Fort Eustis, Virginia. Had the baby there at uh, what was the name? Langley Air Force Base. Okay, that's a big, real big Air Force. Yes. Uh -huh. So your child was born in the United States? Yes. Okay. Okay. Made on foreign soil, but... <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. uh, so after you, what year did you retire? 2009. 2009. Uh, after you, re you retired, of course, that's going on almost 10 years ago. That's like eight, uh, eight, eight years ago? Almost. Yeah. But, so yeah. what, what have you been doing since you, you retired? Well, uh, it, it, it kind of helps to, to, to set the tone for when I came back from active duty. Okay. I finished my active duty assignment in 2000. You know, when was my child born? <laughs> 19. Hmm. I can't think of my child was born right now. Uh, what year? Ninety, ninety-one. Okay. I got off active duty a little bit after that, after she was born. So I uh, stayed in the reserves, and that's when I went down to the Special Ops Command in, in uh, the Navy base, the largest base in the world. Okay. The Naval base. And uh, at the reserves, now you're going to have to ask me that question again, in the reserves. 
what did I do? So I stayed in the reserves, and um, I was a stay-at-home mom okay. for about a year, staying in the reserves, and then I uh, went back to school and earned a from troops to teachers program uh, to become a teacher. And so full time, I started teaching in 1996 after I got my second master's. Okay, so you were a teacher. Mm -hmm. Okay, where did you teach at? In um, in Newport News, Virginia, is where I lived, and then I went to um, uh, the public school system in Dumfries, Woodbridge, Prince William County Schools. Okay. Uh, what subject did you teach? Fourth and fifth grade. Fourth and fifth grade, so you taught little kids. Mm -hmm. Most, okay. Did you enjoy that? I did, we had a lot of fun. Okay. Told a lot of war stories. Okay, <laughs> did they, did they, uh, did you tell them that you were, uh, in the, how did the little kids, did you tell them your little kids that you were in the army and they, they liked that pretty well? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah we would, we would, uh, I played basketball in, in the service in Japan, uh, the console playing champs and, uh, I guess I knew how to play football, but some of the kids wanted to be in my class because they thought I played football. Okay. <laughs> but I, I was pretty military, you know, militarily oriented, mm -hmm. and that structure really helps, you know. But I had to to dumb it down a little bit. Yeah, because people, they, yeah, you can't you can't act like you're a, a lieutenant colonel when you're in an elementary school or. Maybe. Yeah, but. Um, the kids really appreciated, appreciated. Yeah. strictness, you know, yeah. uh, and and my motto was we play hard, but we work hard as well. Okay. Yeah. So we would do push-ups and we would challenge that way. Do you think that your uh, your military training helps you? Definitely helped you in uh, being a good teacher. I do. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think you had? Uh, I mean, I know there were like little kids, but do you think you had higher? Do you think you had? Uh, higher goals for them because you knew that what people can do. Yes, um, I would treat the kids as if they were my own. Okay. I did have a child at, at that time, uh, but you know, so much so that some of them start calling me mom. <laughs> you okay. know, without thinking, you know, mom. I'm not. No, honey, I'm your teacher. You know. Okay. So, but um, I guess I was surprised at the transition from dealing with adults and then dealing with youngsters. And uh, I just loved them. I loved them and we had fun and we, you know, one of the things that, that, that I would talk about when uh, we would have the back to school night. Okay. I would talk to the parents about how you structure the class and so forth. And uh, I would, would, would tell the kids, I said, I don't know what you say to your mom and dad, but you need to say yes ma'am or no ma'am. Or at least no and yes, Not instead yeah. of young, uh huh, yeah. boy, yo, baby, and all yeah. that kind of stuff, you know. Yeah. And uh, so I instilled that in the children, and, and then when they would come across uh, the threshold, if you will, of the classroom, it's like, okay, everything else is out there. You come in here, we're here to learn. This is our class. So we'd have mottos about the class, and I would have them to either shake my hand or give me a hug, whichever was their desire. Okay. So, you know, and, and if they gave me a willing handshake, I said, no, you yeah. need to give me a firm handshake so I know you mean business. Yeah. And uh, so. Yeah, that sounds like you, you use your, uh, I mean, of course you didn't like drill them hard like they were like, like soldiers, but you used. The first class I did business. when I was, <laughs> when I was doing a temporary teaching job. But you, you're probably still in your military mode real heavy. I mean, it was probably. It's. Too, it's yeah. my life, yeah. you know. They say you're army for life, so I'm army for life. Okay. Uh, so how long did you teach? You said you I taught. I uh, had credit for 16 years. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so in between, uh, after eight years that I had taught, I went to, uh, and that was, you know, I was still in the reserves at that time. Then I got called to active duty. I was then assigned at uh, Fort Belvoir, Virginia. Where they had, you know, transportation and direct connect with uh, the uh, wall terror. Okay, this is after 9/11. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So you, yes. when you, you were, uh, you probably uh, knew that after 9/11 you were going to be called uh, called back in some form of fashion, right? I 
anticipated, but uh, I kind of, I, I have to say I missed the military. So when I was assigned at the Special Ops Unit, we had, we had uh, uh, training in regards to what was going to happen. So they knew it before I knew it. And then uh, I went to uh, what was called Defense Logistics Agency in, uh, in Fort Belvoir. And so I ended up getting two assignments over in Kuwait. Okay, so you went to Kuwait. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, how did you uh, How did you feel about uh, did you did you like I mean that was that you went to Japan and Korea How did you feel about going to Kuwait Did you like being there or the, the culture or the food or weather or It was so much more restrictive okay. because we're we're in battle we're in a combat zone and uh, so we we had barbed wire fences on our on the base whereas the others weren't quite okay. like that. And of course, we worked with the uh, the the uh, Kuwaiti force, and then we had there was Marines and everybody over there. Um, and Kuwait was the central point where everybody came into. It was kind of like the hub going into Afghanistan and to Iraq. So you got the stuff going in, and and I tell you, when I when I went over there, it was. Uh, we had to hide our buses when we went into the compound. And urban warfare was quite different from jungle warfare. Yeah. You know, so you had to, it may be, everything is normal all right on, on the other side of the wall, the fence, but inside here it was a different story. Yeah. And so you, we had to carry weapons when we went on the outside. Uh, uh, so, but you never knew who what the enemy was because they were all over the place. Yeah, yeah, they don't wear yeah, uniforms. No. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're kind of fine. Uh, so you, how long were you in Kuwait? My first assignment was a little over eight months. Okay. And then my second assignment, uh, I was I went back to command a unit called the uh, TCSP, the Trans uh, Transship Company, where we had the containers that had. DLA, the Defense Logistics Agency, uh, we produced uh, class one clothing, water, fuel, uh, you name it. So we had the responsibility of making those things at the different depots and then transshipping them to uh, Kuwait and support the war on terror. Okay. Did you uh, talk to your uh, daughter a lot? She no. Was, okay. We kind of became estranged. Okay. She stayed with uh, one of the girls that worked at um, at DLA, um, and she kept her between our home and her home. And when I called my daughter, and it was a, a few times, she was like, "Oh my God, I'm sleepy." But uh, later on, I figured out uh, because it, it was a transition when I came home. Uh, we weren't friends. Okay. We didn't get along. Okay. But it was nothing unusual because uh, I think it was even worse for fathers that came back and they were no longer the head of the house. Yeah. You know. Uh, but she, that was a a means of protecting herself from the idea that mom could be killed. She was trying to detach herself. Detach. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But we're we're wonderful. That's good. Uh, so I guess in, in closing. The, is there anything that you would, uh, the people watching, what would you have them take away from this interview? If you can have, if you can have the floor and say anything you want, what would you have them take? A, what would you have them take away from this interview or your military service? <clears throat> well, I, I, I am a true believer of the draft. Okay. Though I understand why people didn't want that, but we have to have people that support and defend the nation, and it's a means of transitioning from a boy to a man being in the military. And that don't have to be the only thing. You could be a firefighter, policeman, some place where you learn to defend and respect your country and give back at least two years. So I, I would like to see that come back. I am against women being in combat. Okay. But uh, we were there anyway. 
but it was more of a support element. Okay, as in, as in, kick is one thing to be in the in the area, but another thing to be you're saying uh, in the Humvee, knocking in doors and clearing rooms and having firefights. Yeah. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying we have combat arms position. We have three sets of, of, of primary duties. You have the combat arms, which are the ones that are supposed to be on the front line, you know, yeah. your armor, infantry, yeah. etc., SEALs and all. And then you have your combat support. And then that's like uh, log logistician and uh, the ones that be supporting the front line. And then you have the third, combat service support. Yeah. And that's where you have your administration, your, your nursing and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't mean that you won't well, see, the, the, the way that the battle works is that they come after your supply line. And so <clears throat> there were always women there, but I don't think it should be a recommendation or a, a requirement or that you be able to be on the front line as a woman. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything else like you uh, to uh, add or anything that you'd like everybody to know about your, your service or anything? You talk about? Mm, other than um, be all you can be, I like that. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good. I like that motto, even yeah. even though we have the Army of One, I haven't really totally understood it. Be all you be, that was like in the late 80s and 70s kind of one. Mm -hmm. uh, it lasted all the way up to the uh, 90s. Okay. Uh, late 80s, early 90s. Now it's Army Strong. So Army Strong, that's kind of their motto now, right? It was Army Strong, now it's Army of One. Army of One, okay. So yeah, yeah, I know I'm trying to kind of keep up with things like that. I know I know they had the Army Strong and they had the, I remember all the, uh, the uh, Be All You Can Be in the Army, that was like the late 80s and early 70s. That lasted a long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the uniform has changed. Yeah. Yeah. And it keeps changing. The different, uh, did it, the, the digital, they used to have like the digital, now they've got digital, the digital camouflage, kind of like your, your picture of the digital camouflage and, and, uh, what well, it's changed even since that. Yeah, since, in sad, yeah. And it seems like it's changing every four or five years. Okay. The dress uniform has drastically changed. Okay. Now, what year was that picture? Uh, this one, it was in 2000. Seven. Okay. Two thousand seven. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, I just wanted to uh, thank you for coming here, and I thank you for your service, and it was a good talking to you. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank I you. Appreciate it. Thank All you. right.